Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our session, The Impacts of Extreme Climate Events and the Disturbances on Carbon Dynamics. Uh, my name is Qin Feng Xiao. I'm from University of New Hampshire, and my co-chair is uh, Leo Liu from uh, USGS and Aerospace Center. And we have uh, two oral sessions in a row today, and we also have uh, a post session tomorrow morning. And uh, we're going to get started with our first oral session. And uh, our first speaker is Ben um, Bond Lamberty, uh, who is one of our invited speakers today. Ben. Thanks. All right, good afternoon. Um, happy World Soils Day, everyone. It's true. Um, I still need to start quickly by saying thank you. Um, uh, to both the organizers for the invitation to speak. It's great to be here. Uh, my co-authors um, who, who did a huge amount of this work, and in particular, I hope people had a chance to catch uh, Vanessa Bailey's talk a few hours ago, which, which uh, focused really on some of the more microbial dynamics of what I'm going to show today. Um, and and, and a, a, a real thanks to uh, the DOE, uh, the Terrestrial Ecosystem Science Program that, uh, that, funded, this, that funded this work. Um, so, so I'd like then, okay. So, so what I'm talking about today here is a, um, some results from a long-running um, transplant uh, climate change experiment um, that uh, was, in particular, was looking at sort of an overarching question of how will climate change uh, affect, or this is the broad sort of theme, of the structural, microbial, and biochemical dynamics in, in soils, because a, it's a huge unknown, right, as we, as we look forward. Um, and in particular, in this experimental design, um, we've, we've tried to sort of isolate out, as you'll, I hope, see, you know, the, the climate shift from a disturbance effect here. Um, so in uh, Harvey Bolton and Jeff Smith, two of my co-authors, uh, almost pushing towards 20 years ago, 1994, initiated a transplant experiment on Rattlesnake Mountain here. It's in east, eastern Washington state. Um, transplanting between a, a low and a high site that are separated by about 500 meters of vertical elevation on the mountain. Um, and they had pretty big 30 centimeter diameter cores that were, that were transplanted among and, and between these sites. Um, and so the lower site, broadly speaking, this is a pretty, a fairly, um, it's a semi-arid uh, grassland with some shrub system. Again, sort of a 500 meter difference between these two sites. And the lower site, which the thing to keep in mind throughout this talk, um, the lower site is hotter and drier. Okay, so it's about, about six degrees to see hotter and, and considerably drier. The upper site is cooler and wetter. Um, um, and, and the idea was then to use this, hopefully use this as a kind of a surrogate for, for climate change as, as they transplanted these cores. Uh, initial results uh, were published uh, almost, again, almost 10 years ago uh, in, in GCB, looking, um, link it all, lo looking at some of the plant, uh, in particular, dynamics of these. But other than, the, other than the occasional, I think, wildfire sweeping through, these cores have been in place then for 17 years, these big cores. Um, we went back then this spring and, and subsampled these cores. So took these original cores are 30 centimeters. We took about 3 centimeters um, Subcores, but I'm going to call them the, the cores from here on out. Um, and, and so the experimental design, again, just to recap, looks like this. We have an upper site on a mountain and a lower site on a mountain. And in 94, we have cores that are transplanted lower to upper. We have cores that are transplanted upper to lower. And we have cores to try to control for disturbance effects transplanted upper to upper, as well as lower to lower. So just having a disturbance effect, but, but they're, they're put in a new spot in the ground, but still in the same site. Um, so we then subsample in this spring, subsampled from all these cores. In addition, we have a, a native. So we're, we're subsampling as well cores that haven't been subject to any kind of disturbance effect at all. They're, they're na the native soils that have just been sitting there. Um, we have basically 72 cores then that were randomly assigned to one of three experimental streams here. One is a time zero analysis, destructive analysis on the cores. That's 24 cores. And the other 48 then are randomly split between one of two growth chambers, uh, basically environment growth chambers. Um, and these chambers, slightly out of sequence bullets, the time zero measurements um, included a whole bunch of things, but in particular I'm going to mention here today some soil structure and chemistry, some enzymatic assays that were done, RISA, um, ribosomal uh, intergenetics, intergenetics of spacer analysis, so microbial 
community fingerprinting, basically. Um, and then, these, then the 48 cores are split into upper and lower site conditions. So we have these chambers that are mimicking the, the, the site conditions, one chamber for each site. Um, my my co-author, Vanessa Bailey, uh, has, this, has a wonderful thing calling it the Groundhog Day experiment because these cores sat there then for 100 days cycling on June 30th, 2011, the actual weather conditions um, that we're experiencing. And then over then, we have a 100-day um, incubation, and we're measuring then bulk soil respiration, basically with an, with an ergo, with an infrared gas analyzer um, coming off these cores. Uh, so so I, um, I will try to explain as I go through. But broadly speaking, so we have a, um, an N of four, and we have transplant upper to upper, transplant upper to lower, transplant lower upper, lower lower, and then the native lower and native upper. So these are the basic groups of cores that we have that are all then randomly assigned to the chambers. Um, and the incubation conditions then, they sit, and we were trying to, on the, on the right-hand side, you see the two temperature tracks over time and day. As you can see, the lower, that is the, the chamber mimicking the lower side on the mountain, gets hotter as it's, it's following the actual temperature track. There's the upper chamber. And uh, the cores were actually sitting on micropore plates. Um, that, that were watered as necessary, and our goal was to keep them more or less at the field conditions when they were sampled. So a little bit, uh, we did not succeed, but a little bit trying to take soil amount moisture out of the equation. Uh, but for much of the experiment, this is incubation day, and this is sort of how they, this is um, so a violin plot. So it's showing the distribution of, of the masses as we went through the experiment. You can see towards the end, things got a little bit wonky, wonky but mostly we kept the cores to within about 5% of their field conditions. Um, the, w without getting into too much detail, one of the, you know, the, it's kind of a neat, the, the Groundhog Day effect uh, was, was uh, I, I think, a neat uh, experimental, hopefully, aspect of the experimental design. It does make some of the statistics tricky. Uh, I'm not going to be subjecting you to all, to all the gory details, but, you know, you have to, you're, you're, uh, you're then modeling respiration and trying to take into account these fixed and random effects, because we have good a priori reasons, for instance, to think that you know, the 94 cores were originally subsampled, that there's, those are going to be related. Um, but we also use um, some standard ANOVA for especially the time zero measurements. Um, so those time zero, so this is the first experimental stream, right? The 24 cores that they were, we just took out of the ground and analyzed. And you see uh, there are significant differences. These are all significant in bulk density and carbon and nitrogen between the upper and the lower sites. That is their origin. Okay, so not where they spent the 17 years. That was generally not significant, actually. Um, and in one of, the, one of the earlier hypotheses here was that these cores would sort of start to look like, like where they'd been moved to. In, I mean, 17 years, you know. Um, I was, yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, that's a long time. Um, so, but that was generally not significant. What was significant was where they came from. And you can see, so bulk density, um, Again, the, the lower side is a tougher place. The bulk density is higher. There's less carbon and there's less nitrogen in the soil. So this is bulk density, carbon and nitrogen, colored by where the cores came from. Um, so there were significantly differences in these cores. Going in, we couldn't see generally a transplant effect in, uh, for these particular properties. Um, what, what, what did start to, to shake out, become interesting, was some of the, the bulk respiration data, which is um, what, I, what I'm focusing on a little bit here. Um, and so this is a little bit of a complicated graph, um, and the way to read it here is we're segmented into four panels, right? And on the top, where did the core spend its 17 years? Where was its location, in effect, when we sampled it? Was it at the lower site or was it at the upper site? And then on, the, on the, the Y here is where did the core originate? So was, did it originally come from the lower site, the hotter, drier, tougher, or did it originally come from the upper site? Um, and then on the X axis, you have air temperature here, and the Y is respiration rate, basically, as, as, measured, um, as measured evolving out of these cores. Um, first thing I guess I'd point out, there's, um, uh, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of variability. There's high high core to core variability. Uh, so they're colored here by native or transplant. Um, and the good news from our point of view was that the, the native cores looked exactly like the, the transplant cores. That is, the cores that had been taken out of the upper site, humped around in a backpack for an hour, and stuck in the, back into the ground. 17 years later, they look exactly like the native cores that had never been moved. So that was good. We, we appreciated that. Um, there, um, there was also no, so again, we're, we were trying to control for disturbance, and that's, that starts to give us some confidence. 
Um, there was also no chamber effect. So now, it's before, right before I was, I was coloring here by whether they were native or transplant. Now I'm now these same same data, but now colored by upper chamber or lower chamber. One of our earlier hypotheses had been that they might there might be a particular shock as you moved a core that had been sitting in the lower site, for instance, into the upper chamber or vice versa. There might be a chamber effect that we might see, and we did not see that either. What we did see was both temperature and moisture. Again, in spite of our efforts to kind of keep the uh, keep things within a 5% band, uh, moisture does show up as pretty significant in these arid uh, in these arid soils. Temperature was highly significant. Um, generally, the cores, and again, this is consistent with my previous, or a couple slides ago, with a higher carbon, nitrogen, the cooler, wetter site, that upper site on the mountain, um, those cores, and so that's uh, source, it's a little hard to see from this angle. So source upper, um, where the cores that originally came from the upper side of the mountain, have, they're, they're just pumping out more CO2, and that's consistent with the other data we saw. Okay, so you can see I've just fitted here basic uh, Q10 style models, so they give our respiration at 20 degrees C in a Q10. Um, and so they're pumping out, you can see at, at 20 degrees C, they're pumping out a lot more uh, carbon dioxide. Um, the other thing was that, I mean, you see, you see for, for three of these four, you have Q10s, uh, temperature response, that are, that are more or less in the, in the vicinity of two, uh, which as, as a biological system is, is, is pretty much what we'd expect. The exception here is cores that started out at that hot, dry, lower site, okay? So there we, we're going to, uh, we, we have some good a priori reasons to think that they were stressed and, and their microbial communities, as we'll see, you know, potentially pretty fragile. Um, and the, those cores that spent 17 years at the upper site, they were subjected to that climate change and then they're subjected, subjected to another shock as we hauled them out of the ground into the lab. Um, they basically exhibit almost no temperature sensitivity at all. Okay, so they basically aren't responding to temperature. Um, there is, I should say, you know, there's, there's a high degree of scatter here. Um, so there's a lot of core-to-core -core variability. A particular core, um, if, I, if I sort of color these by individual cores, they, they, they look pretty, generally pretty decent. You know, they're following some kind of Q10 response. Um, but you can see there's a lot of variability, but this is a significant effect. I mean, this is, these cores are basically a Q10 of 1.1, uh, give or take. So, so they're, they're really sitting very close to one. Um, this, is a, this is a single slide uh, summing up Vanessa Bailey's talk earlier today, which just points out that the, the two, uh, these two assays that we ran, uh, beta-glucosidase, which is um, associated with cellulose degradation, it's often the rate-limiting step, um, that, that there were significant differences between, between these and um, following, generally speaking, and again, you know, Vanessa's talk was really excellent in, in showing, visualizing this, but um, generally following, again, the respiration results. And in Nagase, um, which is often associated with high fungal activity, um, uh, chitin degradation, um, also tend to, you know, there were, there were some, some non-significance, but you get, a, you get a, the, the cores are breaking out, in other words, in terms of these enzyme assays in ways, broadly speaking, that follow the respiration data. Uh, finally, in the, in the RISA fingerprinting, which I'm not showing at all, it's, qu it's quite interesting in that these, these cores that started their life in the lower, a hot, dry site, spent 17 years at the upper site. These cores, right, the ones that have lost their temperature sensitivity, they break out, their microbial community breaks out as quite different. So it's an interesting uh, link between, again, these, these, um, the fingerprinting, which shows Again, in the multi-parameter space, these points sitting way off there, and then the, that plot, my previous plot, showing a loss of temperature sensitivity effectively. Um, th this is um, just the, the, the consequence of this is that, um, you know, we, if you compute carbon evolved over the entire incubation period, as you'd expect, uh, lower, uh, sorry, upper site co cores originally from the upper site evolve more carbon. That sort of follows from my previous graph. And there's no difference between the hotter chamber and the cooler chamber for these particular, particular cores uh, that came from the lo lower site and went to the upper site. So in conclusion, um, you know, we have soils from the upper site that we've, we found really had high enzymatic potential, faster carbon cycling. So real consistency between the enzymatic assays and the respiration data. Um, and this, these, these cores that started, that went from the lower to the upper, from the hot, stressed, dry conditions up to that upper site, real consistency between the resp bulk respiration data and the RISA fingerprinting. Um, all of which sort of makes, makes us start to think about, you know, uh, again, a microbial community that was started in an extreme environment uh, and had potentially lower resilience to a shock of, of, of climate change. 
in fact, that as, as, they, as they got pushed into this new environment. Um, and you know, how that obviously have, makes us think about our models and how the abiotic typically drivers they incorporate, but, but again, you know, it's sort of um, the forefront of these kind of models right now are things like microbial community dynamics, resource demand, stoichiometry, um, the interesting uh, paper Ballantyne and um, Billings right now in press at GCB looking at some of these things. So potentially, I think, particularly maybe for semi-arid soils, which tend on the fragile side, these uh, could be real important um, dynamics to consider. Thank you. I think we have, uh, we have time for one quick question. Or did I just cow you into submission? OK. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Jeff Hickey from University of Idaho. Jeff. Well, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> thanks for being here, and thanks to Jing Fang and Leo for Okay, thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm gonna talk about some work we're doing to estimate the amount of carbon in trees killed by natural disturbances in recent decades in the western US. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Arian Meddens and Craig Allen, as well as funding from the USGS Western Mountain Initiative <clears throat> and the Forest Service Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center. So it's well known that forests play major roles in the global carbon cycle, also in regional carbon cycling <laughs> and budgets, such as in the western US. And we also know that disturbances play major roles in, in governing or driving the, the net carbon flux from forests as they are associated with changes in photosynthesis and decomposition. So in the western US, the major forest disturbances, the natural ones at least, are bark beetles and fire, and that's what I'm gonna focus on in this talk. So our specific objectives are to quantify the carbon stocks in trees that are killed by these disturbances. We're focusing on carbon stocks um, because they are observationally based. They don't require as much modeling as, say, estimating the net carbon flux. <clears throat> And so we think this is a, a good step towards establishing what the carbon consequences are for these disturbances on forest carbon budgets. Okay, a little bit about our methods. Um, we are used a, a mortality area data set from uh, Arian Menz, who uh, produced a bark beetle uh, mortality area from the US Forest Service Aerial Detection Surveys. These uh, surveys are conducted annually by the Forest Service by observers in planes who record uh, polygons of forest damage. Arian converted these polygons to a one kilometer grid for modeling and ease of uh, processing. Also, Arian converted the affected area, which includes live trees, to mortality area, which is just the area of killed trees. So that better represents the actual damage within a particular grid cell. In addition, there were several lines of evidence that suggested that the um, aerial survey information was underestimating the amount of trees killed. So Arian produced a, an upper estimate that was based on comparison with three areas of uh, remotely sensed imagery and three different forest types. So we produced uh, different adjustment factors that <clears throat> we called the uh, more realistic upper estimate uh, for our results. And just last week, we noticed that perhaps our uh, adjustment factor in lodgepole pine was a bit high. And so I'm showing you here a more conservative middle estimate. Oh, and the map here uh, is just the results from Arian's uh, data where the warm colors show the fraction of grid cell that's uh, affected by bark beetles or um, area that's killed, the canopy area that's killed by beetles. We did an analogous thing for forest fires. <clears throat> we started with a burn severity map from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity database. These are annual uh, data sets, annual uh, values from 1984 to 2011. 
I'll show you just through 2010. Um, <clears throat> these are based on Landsat 30 meter classification into unburned areas, burned areas uh, with uh, hot, low, moderate, and high severity. <clears throat> and you can see um, the, on the map uh, the um, areas that indicate uh, uh, in red are high severity <clears throat> burned areas within one location, one uh, fire, and then the yellows are moderate severity. So you can see a, quite a bit of uh, spatial variability within one fire. And uh, MTBS maps fires greater than 1,000 acres in the west. So we focused on tree mortality, and for an estimate of tree mortality, we focused first on, an up, on a lower estimate, which was just the high severity burned areas. And then we also produced another estimate that uh, combined high and moderate uh, burn severity. And this classification uh, agrees to some degree with uh, the results of um, Bardon Gamir et al., whom Chris Williams talked about uh, in his talk yesterday. Okay, we, not, we wanted to focus again on tree mortality, so we wanted to mask out fire areas that were associated with grasslands or shrublands. We had to produce a, a forest mask that, was, uh, that captured forests, including those forests that may have been recently disturbed, at least recently relative to satellite observations. <clears throat> but we did want to include uh, observations where possible to, to produce this forest mask. So we combined the USGS National Land Cover data set with uh, a land fire existing vegetation types, and those, are, uh, using, those use satellite observations from different time periods. And we saw that uh, in some burned areas, the land fire data set captured the forest better, and in other areas, uh, the NLCD data set captured the forest areas better. So we combined the two. And then <clears throat> we have a map, or we produced a map of carbon stocks based on a forest biomass map produced by Blackard et al., who developed a statistical model uh, using the Forest Service forest inventory and analysis plots and extrapolated those across the landscape with uh, this model that used uh, modus imagery as well as ancillary data sets such as climate and topography. So this is a 250 meter map that we aggregated to the one kilometer grid cell. Um, I, I neglected to mention we also aggregated the fire data set to one kilometer grid cell. And we added an estimate of uh, below ground biomass to come up with a total forest carbon stock, or carbon, yeah, carbon stock. And then we simply overlaid the disturbance maps on top of the carbon, uh, the carbon map uh, for each of the two disturbance types, bark beetles and fire. So we produced annual maps of um, carbon in trees killed by each of these disturbance types. So some results. Um, these are the time series of from uh, 1984 to 2010 for fires and from 97 forward for bark beetles. What's plotted on the y-axis is the, the total carbon in the western U.S. associated with these disturbances. The beetles are <coughs> in red, and you can see the high, medium, and lower estimates, and in blue, the high, the upper, and lower estimates. <coughs> you can see the increase in activity in both of these disturbance types in the latter part of the record, and that corresponds to um, more carbon in killed trees. And you can see also that beetles, um, at least for the middle and upper estimates, um, have higher values, uh, kill more trees in, in individual years than does fire. Uh, the cumulative impacts is shown in this table <coughs> where I aggregated um, the, the across time what the uh, carbon killed trees was, so for beetles, the estimate was uh, 24 to 333 teragrams of carbon, which represents about one half to six percent of the total carbon in the western U.S. in force. Uh, during that same time period in fires, there was a, a, a slight reduction, 91 to 177 teragrams of carbon, which represents about one to three, one and a half to three percent of the total carbon. And then if, you, if I added the earlier period, Back to 1984, the, the fire amounts increased somewhat to 2 to 4 percent of the total carbon. Where, does this, uh, where do these disturbances kill trees? 
These are maps of uh, the two disturbance types, fire on the top, beetles on the bottom, and these are the upper estimates just to show you the spatial patterns. <clears throat> for fires, uh, and this is total teragrams of carbon aggregated for an ecoregion and then plotted for that particular ecoregion. <clears throat> so uh, fires uh, kill trees or have the most carbon kill trees in the Middle Rockies as well as in Northern California and Oregon. And these are uh, about 40 to 50 teragrams of carbon cumulative over the time period. <clears throat> in contrast, the beetles uh, were focused more on the Rockies, both the, the, well, all of the Rockies, Northern, Southern, and Middle Rockies, uh, and had higher values, uh, up to 60 teragrams of carbon within an ecoregion. And I neglected to mention that uh, for fires, these, uh, the amount of carbon was about 5 to 10 percent of the total carbon in the, that particular ecoregion. Whereas for beetles in the Rockies, it was about 8 to 15 percent. Okay, breaking these out by forest types, <clears throat> the top plot shows the total amount of carbon, and the bottom, uh, the bottom plot shows the percentage of carbon by forest type within that particular forest type. Uh, the red plot shows the, the bark beetles, um, and the, the blue plot shows the regional um, estimate for fires, or from fires. You can see that lodgepole pine, uh, or beetles affected lodgepole pine the most out of all the, the uh, forest types and disturbance types, with a, a, almost 120 teragrams of carbon in killed trees, at least for the upper estimate, which represents over 15% of the carbon within the lodgepole pine forests. Beetles also kill trees at higher elevations in spruce fir forests, where about 10% of the, the carbon in those forests were in, in trees killed by beetles. In contrast, the fires in red tended to be, or sorry, in blue, tended to be focused more on the lower and drier forest types, ponderosa pine and uh, Douglas fir, and they killed uh, about five, three to five percent of the carbon in those uh, forest types. Okay, so I was also interested in comparing how these uh, disturbance types affected carbon relative to harvest. So this uh, plot shows you the annual mean amount of carbon in killed trees. <clears throat> Again, for bark beetles, uh, uh, 2007 to 2010, there was about 1.7 to 24 teragrams carbon per year in killed trees. Slightly less for forest fires in that particular time frame, 6.5 to 13 teragrams of carbon per year. And when I included the earlier time period with lower fire activity, that dropped by about two-thirds, or dropped by a third. So the harvest uh, information is from the, the U.S. Forest Service annual, or sorry, decadal sort of state of the nation forest reports. From Smith et al., uh, 2010, there were four time periods reported here. In the earlier time period, uh, there was much more harvesting going on, so 81 teragrams per car um, carbon per year were uh, removed or associated with harvest. Whereas in the later, the last two decades, that dropped significantly down to about 49 or 50 teragrams of carbon per year. So you can see if you focus on the, the upper estimates, at least uh, the sum here, about 30 um, teragrams carbon per year, a little more, is somewhat comparable, at least in order of magnitude, relative to harvest, at least in the later years. Okay, so to uh, summarize and conclude, I showed you that we estimated the carbon stocks in trees killed by beetles and uh, fires using observations, and again, we focused on the western U.S. in recent decades when we had uh, information. Our results suggest that uh, beetles may affect more carbon than forest fires, although I note that there, was a, there is significant uncertainty in the beetles and, to a lesser degree, some uncertainty in the, the fire estimates as well. Most of the forests in the west were affected by these disturbances. I didn't mention that, but uh, in the maps you could tell from the colors that uh, there was some disturbance in most of the forests. The Rockies in particular were hard hit um, as beetle outbreaks were extensive there, and at least in the middle Rockies there were lots of fires. And the higher elevation forests seemed to be affected more by beetles. Um, so spruce fir forests at the highest elevations and then in the sort of middle montane forest types, lodgepole pine, 
with fires tending to affect lodgepole pine and lower uh, forest types more. And then uh, relative to harvest, uh, the, each of these disturbance types are significant impacts to carbon cycling in the western U.S. And so our next steps are to assess what the regional scale fluxes are um, using modeling. So thank you very much for your attention. I think we have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, well, the, the issue with interpreting that figure is that those, those disturbances didn't occur in the same locations. So fires may have been prominent in the early 2000s in the upper, or sorry, northern Rockies, whereas the beetles were attacking trees basically everywhere. And so it's hard to interpret uh, the same climate signal as affecting both of those disturbance types. Yeah, so um, they're fairly well separated. Uh, the, the beetles are identified in our data set by observers in planes who can easily distinguish fires from um, damaged trees, trees damaged by beetles in particular, which typically turn red or at least yellow. Um, and then the MTBS data set, again, is classified using um, uh, techniques that well, they, they classify the individual fires, so they know where the fires are from just uh, Forest Service reports, um, and so they go in and classify those areas. So I think they're fairly well separated. Let's move on to our next talk due to time constraint. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for giving us such an exciting, invited talk. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Li Zhang, uh, who is here to update uh, us on the impacts of uh, extreme spring drought on carbon dynamics by flying 6,000 miles. Good afternoon, everyone. Here I will talk about our research on drought uh, disturbance on vegetation ecosystem in southwestern China. At, at the beginning, I would like acknowledge my co-authors and uh, the uh, funding resources, Natural, Resor uh, Natural, Natural Fund Science Foundation of China and ABCC programs. Uh, background, uh, the, if we look at the right panel, it's a Palmer Drought Severity Index, uh, the trends of PDSI before 50s and after 50s. The drier trends is indicated by the uh, red colors. If we compare these two panels, we see the drier trend is much more uh, extended and severe after, uh, during the late 50s. So the global land area effect, affected by drought has significantly increased during the last five decades. And the IPCC said it, the drought are projected to become more frequent, um, more severe. Uh, as we all know, drought has profound, uh, profound impact on ex ecosystem carbon, and it also can induce, uh, induce some fire and tree mortality and insect outbreaks, which will indirectly influence carbon cycling. Uh, a lot of research has done the uh, drought impact on global scale, and also uh, continent, continent scale and regional scale, such as North America and China, and uh, um, Amazon and Europe. Um, so here, our objective here is to examine the response of terrestrial ecosystem to the 2010 spring drought in southwestern China. We try to characterize the extent, duration, and severity of the spring drought and assess, assess its influence on vegetation. Um, our science question is, what are the impacts of spring drought? Because previous uh, literature talk about a lot of summer drought, so here we think it's a good chance to test the spring drought. Here is our study areas, southwestern China. 
it covers five, five provinces of China, and the Yunnan province is the most impacted by drought, uh, in this drought. And this region uh, occurred drought recently, uh, a very frequently recent because it's uh, uh, special climate uh, conditions and uh, uh, hilly landscape. The, this region belongs to the subtropic monsoon clim climate of China, and uh, the custom landform uh, is, has the character of uh, this water dissolution, which will lead to the infiltration of surface water that causes the drought change worse and worse. Uh, the major vegetation types here is uh, forest, savanna, cropland, and grassland. The first three uh, vegetation types occupy about uh, 25 to 30 percent, and the grassland has about 12 percent here. Mm. This drought, we call it once in a century drought. It has a lot of agricultural impact. The gap, if we, uh, the gaps be, between the cracks is about uh, 10 centimeters. Um, <coughs> people were short of drinking water during the drought. If we look at the uh, uh, famous uh, Huang Guoshu Falls, this is during now drought time. This is drought time. The falls became very tricky, tricky during the drought. And uh, it also has a lot of economic impacts. The fish in the pond dried and died, and the, this is the coffee trees uh, also died. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, the drought started from July 2009, and it continues to severely drought in September 2009, and then it changed to extreme drought on end of January 2010 uh, and until end of April. So it's a typical spring drought and uh, it's a very sustained and a severe drought. So we want to focus on the spring drought impact over this region. And uh, this is uh, <coughs> climate conditions during the drought here. The above panel is the uh, precipitation time series. The bottom one is temperature time series. The red line shows the precipitation or temperature during the drought period. The black one is the long-term means. So we see that from September to May, precipitation decreased around 12%, and in February, it particularly decreased by 51%. It's about 26 millimeters. The mean air, air temperature increased by 8% and increased about 1.6 and 1.3 degrees Celsius degree in January and February. So the drought has uh, uh, features with large water deficit and uh, higher temperature together. Uh, this is a special distribution of the anomaly uh, of precipitation and the PDSI. The drought affects the northwestern China in most of area except the northern part. About 56% of the region suffered from severe drought, and the precipitation uh, deficit particularly severe in Yunnan and in Yunnan province and, and other south south state uh, provinces. And the precipitation in the spring decreased by about 13%, and the mean air temperature increased by 3.9 degree. The higher temperature increased the invapor transportation, which exacerbates the drought more. This panel shows the impact of this drought on uh, EVI vegetation index and uh, uh, gross uh, primer production. And uh, <coughs> this drought, we can see, reduce uh, vegetation a lot during the springtime, but it also continue reduced the vegetation greenness and the productions during the summer season until August. 
uh, regionally, EY and GPP declined by 9% and 40% in April, and the EVI decreased by 12% and 6% in June and July, and GPP decreased by 40% and 30%. Uh, this graphic shows a, a different in, uh, impact of this drought on different vegetation ecosystems. Uh, shrubland and uh, grassland are least impacted by this drought because these two uh, mo mostly distribute in the northern, northern portion of the region. If you remember, I mentioned that the northern part is less affected by this drought. And the savanna uh, is um, damaged a lot because this, uh, this uh, mostly distributed in Yunnan province, its south, south part of China. Um, for the three forest type, evergreen forest is least impact because it's also uh, mostly uh, distributed in north part. But for this forest, although forest has a, is more resilient to drought because it has deeper root and uh, can uh, access uh, groundwater from deeper uh, deeper soil, but because, uh, this drought is more severe uh, and causes a lot of tree uh, um, tree damage and mortality, and also induce some uh, tree uh, induce some fire. So this two type was uh, uh, impact a lot. This shows again shows the uh, coffee trees, dead coffee trees, um, because. Uh, Drought limits the water for irrigation, so cropland is the most impact types in, uh, during this drought. Uh, <coughs> during the spring, uh, cropland GPP decreased by 60% and 40% in March and May. And after the uh, spring, the spring drought continued to surprise the growth of crops. In June and July, the GPP was 19 and 16 percent uh, lower than long, uh, 10 year period. <coughs> the negative effect of the drought on annual pro primer productions were part partly offset by the high productivity in August and early fall because the exceptionally wet condition in late summer and early fall. If we look at the bottom pan, the red, uh, the red one is. Uh, Precipitation is much higher than long-term mean, which help the vegetation a lot during the late summer and early fall. Another reason is the farmer practice adopted to mitigate drought effects. Uh, farmer here, they planted a different crop type in a same field, but not a single field, which helped to improve uh, the crop yields by up to 30%, actually. Um, <coughs> This panel shows the uh, annual anomaly of EVI, GPP, and NPP. On average, nearly 63% of the region showed declines in annual GP NPP. And the GPP and the NPP reduced by 65 and 46 uh, teragram carbon per year. And a lot, for many years, EVI decreased by 0.05 to 0.1, and the GPP decreased by 200 and 400 uh, gray camper per, uh, per square meter and per year, and the MPP decreased by 100 to 200 units. Um, this graph shows the uh, MPP anomalies, annual MPP anomalies. See, we see the 2010 spring drought caused the low, almost the lowest uh, annual MPP. This one is similar to another year, 2001, 2000, uh, 2000, 2000 is another driest year of the last five decades. Mm, this panel shows the relative change of uh, EY and GPP during the springtime, March to May. And the cumulative spring EY and GPP decrease in 2010 for all vegetation type except grassland and the cropland savanna and the deciduous forest were the most impact system with reduction of 16, 15, and 11 percent. This panel shows the relative change for annuals. Uh, cropland and sa uh, savanna exist the greatest relative change and the cropland, the region uh, 
uh, regional in annual MPP decreased by 60%. And uh, the last one shows for shrubland, annual JPP uh, decreased, but annual MPP decreased. And for deciduous forest, we found annual um, JPP increased, but MPP decreased. We think it's very interesting probably because the different response of respiration uh, to this drought during the spring. And for, from our research, we found similar to summer drought, the spring drought still have a large impact on ecosystem. So spring drought may be, uh, so vegetation may be far more sensitive to spring drought than summer drought because water stress in spring can directly reduce photosynthesis, supply canopy development, and shortening the growing season lines. And also, it also can enhance summer respiration and constrain annual carbon uptake by regulating the available soil moisture during the summer season. For our conclusions, the 2010 spring drought substantially reduced the EVI GMPP during spring and also subsequent summer times. The vegetation did not fully recover from the spring drought until August. The drought reduced annual MPP and GPP by uh, 46 and 65 uh, units. Similar to summer drought, uh, drought, spring drought also have significant impact on vegetation product and carbon cycling. Thanks for your attention. We do have time for one or two quick, quick questions. Yes. Is that question in the back? No. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to our next uh, talk. Our next speaker is uh, Justin Fisk from University of Maryland. Justin Fisk, I'm uh, going to discuss some of the ongoing work in our group that's trying to connect uh, some of the disturbance work that we do, in my case particularly tropical cyclone disturbance, uh, to uh, impacts on our ability to mitigate climate change in the future. Um, most climate mitigation strategies rely on policies um, that enhance or uh, maintain or enhance the terrestrial uh, uh, carbon sequestration um, in addition to transitions to uh, more carbon efficient technologies. And uh, these, uh, these strategies depend on, um, uh, these strategies may be impacted by changes to disturbance rates in the future and uh, significant impacts to the sequestration rate may change our ability um, or the path towards our uh, sequestration. So one of the largest disturbance rates that impacts forests is tropical cyclones. Um, with um, dramatic impacts on structure and functioning. Uh, uh, one of my co-authors, uh, Jeff Chambers, uh, used remote sensing and uh, field data to estimate the impacts of Hurricane Katrina and found that a single storm uh, killed 330 million trees, approximately 330 million trees, killed or severely damaged, and that was a loss of biomass carbon of about 100 petagrams or teragrams, which is an amount that's equivalent to the U.S. carbon sink in forest trees from a single storm. Um, and uh, we've built on that work. Uh, Hong Chen Zhang uh, used the, the relationship between wind speed and uh, mortality and damage uh, determined from studying Katrina uh, t to build a reconstruction of all of the tropical cyclones that have impacted the U.S. over the last 150 years. And he found uh, the top panel here is the biomass loss from all of those storms, and the bottom panel is the carbon release after the decomposition of that material. And he found that uh, about 50 teragrams of uh, biomass is lost annually 
uh, resulting in about 25 teragrams of carbon released into the atmosphere. Now, there's strong evidence for uh, some changes to these patterns in the future. The, uh, there's growing evidence that there's a trend uh, over the last several de decades in the strength of storms that's been linked to sea surface temperature and that there's a potentially a 30% increase in the number of strong storms for a one degree change in sea surface temperature. Um, modeling experiments suggest that there may be as much as a doubling of the number of strong storms by the end of the century. So our ability to, to estimate the impacts of that is going to rely on the development of uh, dynamic models that can simulate uh, the effects of disturbance and recovery of this type. And to that end, we've developed the capability to simulate uh, tropical cyclone disturbance um, in a dynamic ecosystem model, the ecosystem demography model. Like many other large scale ecosystem model, it starts with plant physiology and ecosystem biogeochemistry and predicts the regional scale ecosystem structure and flux. But unlike most other models, it's uh, individual based. Uh, so it, uh, it plants, individual plants of uh, multiple plant functional types compete for water, light, and nutrients. Uh, and it's efficiently scaled to large scale. So you can capture uh, the dynamics of disturbance and recovery in a way that a lot of other models can't because you make direct connections to uh, stem damage estimates, um, such as those that were used for the Hong Chen Zhang study. Uh, this is some results from, from using ED to, to produce the same estimates of biomass loss from the empirical field-based uh, <laughs> previous work. And you can see there's a high level of agreement um, from what Ed predicts and what the previous estimates were. Um, so we're pretty pleased with uh, the, the ability for Ed to capture these dynamics. But beyond the biomass losses, using a dynamic model, you can look at the net ecosystem flux and the net, eco and the net change of carbon storage. Um, which is clearly important to understanding the future balance of the ecosystem. So the top panel shows the effect, impacts of net ecosystem or <laughs> impacts of tropical cyclones on net ecosystem flux over the U.S. for that period, the last 150 years. And you can see there are periods where large storms uh, create uh, the cause a net source of carbon, but there are also long periods where recovery from previous storms create a, a, a substantial sink. Um, and so the balance shifts over time. And the lower panel shows that impacts on carbon storage. And, and, and again, you can see that there, the patterns of storms have a large influence on how much carbon is being stored in, in these coastal ecosystems in the US. Um, we've built on that to, uh, to, to generate some future simulations. Um, this is just an example where we, you know, the top panel shows an extension of that historic record out to the end of the century using a stochastic ensemble of, of hurricane uh, simulations under a scenario where we increase uh, the, the tropical cyclone disturbance rate by about 35% by the end of the century, which is in line with the estimates that I talked about earlier. Um, what you'll notice is the increase in biomass loss, that sort of green line average of those stochastic simulations at the end of the century, doesn't increase by 35% because there's a fairly large reduction in the standing biomass resulting from the previous increase in storms. And this lower figure shows uh, that sort of the percent change uh, in, in forest carbon storage at the end of the century resulting from this increase in storms. So to connect this with uh, the carbon mitigation policies. Uh, we, we, we're working to develop a connection with uh, an integrated assessment model, um, to the global change assessment model, uh, which is a, a, it uses estimates of, of uh, population growth and uh, economic productivity and technological advances and competes the demand for energy and agriculture and potentially the value of carbon stored in natural ecosystems. Um, and it weighs those emissions from industrial and terrestrial sources against a, a climate policy where cl uh, carbon emissions are given a price um, so they can compete economically with these emissions and tries to solve for an efficient solution. 
um, and some work out of our group by a co-author, uh, Yannick Lepage, uh, has, has uh, investigated the sensitivity of those mitigation strategies to disturbance rates. And so this is you know, a cartoon schematic of if you had decreasing uh, disturbance rates in the future, that would lead to more carbon stored in forests, and that might potentially lead to uh, the ability to emit more uh, carbon from fossil fuels and other industrial activity and still meet your target. Conversely, if we increase that, that's going to decrease the amount of carbon stored in forests, and that would in turn affect how much, uh, how quickly we had to transition away from uh, carbon-based uh, fuels and industrial emissions. So here's some results from that study, um, which is in prep at the moment. And what you're looking at here is on the horizontal axis, uh, it's the percent change in disturbance rate from present uh, disturbance rates from about half the disturbance rate currently to about double the rate currently and time along the x-axis with uh, uh, over the course of the century. And so you can see in the upper left the terrestrial emissions as expected as disturbance rates increase there'll be more emissions from those patterns uh, from, from the increased disturbance and the increase in uh, need for that uh, land uh, for other purposes. Uh, but the two right panels show the fossil fuel and industrial emissions and the percentage of energy that's getting that that's being uh, generated by fossil fuels in the future. And you can see that as disturbance rates increase, we have to transition away from fossil fuel use and uh, carbon emissions in industry much quicker than, than in lower disturbance rates. Um, and this has uh, important implications for the carbon price that uh, is necessary to uh, economically incentivize meeting these carbon mitigation uh, targets. Um, so we, uh, that of course uh, is sort of a loose connection with disturbance where we would like to, GCAM does not have a mechanistic uh, ecosystem component or any parameterized uh, version of specific disturbances. So we are developing a new model which will use the ecosystem dynamics for MED and our ability to connect this directly with disturbance um, and use the and couple that with the socioeconomics from GCAM and some down, land use downscaling algorithms uh, uh, to connect the regional nature of GCAM to the more gridded nature of ED. Um, and we're calling it IED for integrated ED um, and it will have a single carbon cycle across all models. Um, so GCAM will uh, simulate the economy and energy and agriculture and provide regional land use um, decisions to GLM, which will use the carbon stocks from ED to uh, make, to spatially desegregate that uh, information into a set of gridded land use transitions uh, and harvest area, you know, harvest locations, which will be used to control the land use dynamics in ED. ED can then calculate uh, the carbon fluxes resulting from the land use decisions um, and provide that information to GCAM for future decision making. Uh, in addition to the, the potential stocks and fluxes which are necessary for GCAM to make decisions about where is an appropriate location to uh, you know, expand forests for carbon sequestration. Um, so there's ongoing work. Uh, to continue to develop a range of scenarios of future tropical cyclone patterns and to force IED with that range under a variety of uh, climate mitigation targets. Um, and then to analyze the regional and uh, global and regional consequences for land use patterns, energy technology balance, carbon and food prices. And uh, we have some parallel work. I mean, clearly tropical cyclones although large, are only one of a number of disturbance agents that may change in the future and affect uh, uh, you know, a, a limited subset of uh, terrestrial ecosystems. So we have parallel work to, uh, to parameterize and implement other disturbance agents, uh, particularly fire. We've, um, Ed's got an uh, established fire model. Um, and uh, climate-induced changes in forest productivity on, on these climate mitigation strategies. So uh, to wrap this up, the climate mitigation strategies are highly sensitive to altered disturbance rates. Tropical cyclones have the um, potential for large changes in global patterns. 
um, in the future and a range of scenarios is worth exploring. And uh, improved climate mitigation strategies will depend on better representation of terrestrial ecosystems uh, to, to connect these uh, the dynamics of disturbance and recovery and the resulting impacts. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the NASA Terrestrial Ecology Program for funding uh, this research. We do have time for questions. Any questions? Sure, Ben. Okay. Justin, are you guys um, just going to be varying um, cyclone intensity or also like traps? Like right. So there's evidence beyond uh, beyond just the evidence for the strongest evidence for change is for intensity, but there's evidence for frequency, which may have different effects. Certainly has a different temporal effect. And then there's there's a significant amount of evidence that. Um, Climate change may influence the position of the jet stream, that which may steer tracks in, in different ways. And and there's uh, uh, this may have a large a large effect because locally, you know, if if we focus all the tracks in one area because they're steered some other way, like that's going to have very different effects than spread out over the entire area. We may level forest one place and have sequestration another. So we're going to explore uh, all of those. Just a technical question for you. Sure. So for your carbon model, how long does it take to finish the simulation for a given grid cell? For a given grid cell? Grid cells are quick. The, the ecosystem model is, is quick. Um, it takes... Um, is that in seconds or minutes? Seconds. Okay. Seconds. And so we are able to... There, this is a... GCAM is uh, iterative in its uh, solving, and so we actually have to run Ed uh, multiple times per GCAM time step. And so uh, we, we've worked a lot on getting Ed to be efficient running on a large cluster so that we can run um, many possible solutions to find the best. Uh, Good to deny that. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Our next, speaker, our next speaker happens to be my co-chair, Leo Liu. Leo. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about one project still going on and uh, trying to do assessment of carbon sequestration potential across the country. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the results from the Western United States. It's not moving, is it? Oh, it's okay, I'm going to talk about three things. First one is the scope of the work, then modeling framework, and then the results. Next one. The uh, project, uh, it's called Land Carbon Project, and it's mandated by the law. It's 2007 Energy Independence uh, Security Act. We have for two broad uh, objectives. First one is to assess national potential for carbon sequestration and also reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, methane and uh, nitrous oxide from all ecosystems, including terrestrial and aquatic systems from 1992 to 2050. The second objective is trying to uh, improve scientific understanding on carbon dynamics, especially regarding to the impact of uh, land use change and disturbances and climate change as well. The scope is uh, include all the ecosystems Terrestrial ecosystems include forest, cropland, cropland, wetlands, and uh, also include aquatic systems and coastal systems. There are two time periods. One is baselines from these contemporary timelines from 2001 to 2005. Here there's one thing. And uh, we have projections from 2005 to 2050. 
And um, one of the uniqueness of this project is trying to uh, include as much or as many disturbances and managing information as possible. And I think probably the, uh, one of the um, uh, most complicated or very brave effort trying to incorporate all these kind of things listed here, insects and disease storms, erosion deposition, and some of the things included, I think, it's uh, like uh, maybe none have been considered in the past. It's like crop engineering and uh, some other things, like my new addition. And um, we're trying to see how carbon is changing across the country and also in, over time. And uh, at the end, we're trying to um, attribute all these kind of changes, why carbon is changing and what kind of choices we can have to improve carbon sequestration in different systems. Another thing that we're trying to look at is the uncertainty and um, how big is uncertainty and also where does uncertainty come from. So at the end, we're trying to uh, come up with mitigation strategies to see how can we um, do carbon sequestration improve carbon sequestration. Another big uh, thing is actually it's um, trying to link the terrestrial ecosystem process with aquatic systems to see how much carbon uh, is um, sequestered in um, lowland area and also in streams and uh, um, water bodies like uh, uh, lakes and reservoirs and the coastal areas. The assessment is, uh, has been phased out. The first one was accomplished several, years, uh, several months ago. That's Great Plains. And uh, the Western report is released today. And we are working on the um, uh, eastern part of the uh, country. That's going to be really, uh, finished by, the end, by in maybe next half a year. The modern framework, well, it's, this is uh, the big uh, framework, the entire project. We have for scenario development, policy management um, projections, and also land use change modeling. There's disturbances modeling as well. At the end, we have um, terrestrial and aquatic biogeochemical modeling. I'm going to talk about the terrestrial part today. And this, we have a model developed at USGS. It's called James. It has, um, it's kind of ensemble based modeling approach. It has, uh, it can encapsulate several models, um, multiple models. One is painted by number, it's a kind of spreadsheet model. And EDCM, erosion deposition carbon model, and the century and other models can be incorporated into this system. And yet it has data simulation schemes in the, in the system. So a lot of things, model simulation or model parameter generation can be generated on the fly. And we use a lot of ground observation from like census data or monitoring networks from Forest Service or USDA or some other agencies. We have remote sensing data or, or uh, flux, flux tower, all these kind of observations, trying to pull this information in. And at the end, we simulate carbon, nitrogen, water cycles uh, in different ecosystem you know, over large area. It's from the very beginning, we uh, actually trying to pull as much information as possible, but we found out a lot of information doesn't even exist. So we spend a lot of time actually trying to pull out information from different sources. These are uh, here to show some of the data layers that we pulled together from census data or from other um, like, um, inventory data from Forest Service. And uh, there's a lot of work being trying to figure out the thinning insects, disease, and so weather-related damage, all these kind of things. So a lot of um, data pulled from the inventory data here. And also among new addition, fire, we have people doing work on fire, and tillage, nitrogen and fertilization. One of the key things actually for the James is it's the capability to pull out a lot of management information, the distribution information for each pixels, basically, using stochastic uh, approach. Every month you can uh, prescribe 
uh, different management practices, and then the model can take into uh, simulations. This is the results which show um, how to constrain the model simulations. We used uh, just one example to show how we use MODIS MPB uh, information to constrain the model simulations. This is comparison at the county level. Each dot uh, represents each county in the Western United States. So the, uh, and also this one shows a spatial pattern of agreement for one of the ecoregions. For the simulations, we have for use three models, biogeochemical models. One is painted by number, and another one is the erosion deposition carbon model, and another one is the century. We use the three IPCC scenarios, A1, B, A2, and B1. We use also three GCM um, climate projections to include different uncertainties in, in, in all these kind of simulations or projections. For land cover, we spend a lot of time to Terry So and other people in, uh, in this project, spend a lot of time trying to uh, link international to IPCC scenarios up you know, all the way to pixel level kind of dynamics. And they spend, they hold a lot of uh, regionalized workshops to discuss with expertise uh, in the local scale and trying to downscale IPCC scenario to the ecoregion level across the country. Those are, are some of the um, uh, projections of land cover change uh, across the country, and uh, right now all the uh, area actually has been finished. Just get one example to see how shrubland actually changed uh, in some in the we uh, western United States. It's, this uh, shrubland has been pushed out by open expansion and agricultural expansion and the A1P, A1B scenario. Another scenario is B1, um, how shrubland actually is being coming back. And also, the f organization actually still push out uh, shrubland in some of the areas. This is just one example shows the dynamics on landscape. And for carbon storage, this shows a map of carbon storage in vegetation and soil across this western United States. And the forest is the dominant uh, carbon store storage uh, ecosystem. And we have some other uh, minor ecosystem, like agriculture and the shrubland in this region. This is the final map that shows the carbon sequestration potential, uh, potential across the western United States and the uncertainties. This uh, is the average conditions for uh, 21 model simulations across, uh, for different uh, combination of land use change, climate, and the different models. And there is some kind of interesting thing that shows up in the northwest, United, uh, northwest uh, part of the region. And, um, there was a lot of uh, cutting going on, and also because of the, we used uh, MODIS kind of for data to drive the model, basically to data assimilation. I think this area probably picked up some of the mortality or insect disease activities in this part of the country. But we, uh, we are looking into details right now and uh, trying to figure out what's going on behind all these kind of things. And uh, some other things you see in California, something actually might be weird coming up. Because we, you know, for agricultural systems, we have for, we didn't map agricultural crops in detail, but, but we use a stochastic process to actually allocate or uh, downscale the uh, crop land in general into crop species. So that might introduce some kind of uncertainties here. So next day we were trying to figure out what's going on in some of the localized area to see what are you know, the driving forces, what are the uncertainties related to this kind of uh, products. And this is carbon sequestration in the uh, Western United States, and the forest is a major uh, ecosystem to sequester carbon in the future. And uh, actually, all systems look like they're sequestering carbon. That's, uh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, agriculture is also the second biggest one. And um, one of the things I think come up with, probably a lot of people say it's a surprise, is uh, we consider the genetic improvement of agricultural crops um, in the past and also continue into the future. That's the thing in speak. Uh, we saw some people actually take field measurements in Iowa, some places still see carbon sequestration in cropland. 
So that's actually it's pretty consistent with our projections here. And this one is kind of regional big picture kind of things, and uh, we see different color, different lines, so that's scenario difference. This means in this area, actually, the scenario or policy management can make a difference. And if you actually see a lot of lines that overlap, at least for our scenario, the scenario we developed, the scenario doesn't make too much difference. But there is a lot of uncertainty related to climate change, model uncertainty, these kind of things. So overall, a lot of uh, different uh, regional patterns or driving forces actually shows up in, in different regions. In summary, this uh, is a big effort, and for this uh, report, we covered about uh, two or three million square meters in the, in the United States. And the forest is a major carbon storage uh, and also carbon sequester. And in the, United States, in the Western United States, about 91 teragrams of carbon is sequestered by all ecosystems. But the terrestrial ecosystem is a major one, sequestered about 95 of the total, 95 percent of the total. And this carbon sequestration rate is about 5 percent of the uh, fossil fuel uh, emissions of the country in 2010. It's a pretty significant number. And also, in the future, it looks like the carbon sequestration is going to slow down in the future because of the forest aging and also some other factors. We do have time for one quick question. In the shrubland area, we look in some of the things, and uh, it's uh, even some of the uh, GCMs actually pre predict a dry or some pre GCM predict wetter. So the uncertainty is pretty, is pretty big. Some models actually shows uh, increase. Some uh, some models are give you a pretty flat kind of future. So there's a lot of uncertainties, uh, either in the project, uh, climate projection or the model, uh, the mechanism behind the models. So there's a lot of things we need to actually get into it. Because the shrubland, actually, you see some of the things, the entire annual variability is big because of the annual change of climate can drive the carbon dynamics very dramatically. But also, it's a huge area. Sometimes you sequester a little bit of carbon or lose carbon, that has a huge impact in, the, in this region. So we are looking into that kind of details. Okay, thank you, Leo. Let's move on to our next talk. Our next speaker is uh, Susanna Lutledge, who is from a gorgeous place that's also 6,000 miles away from here. Good afternoon, everybody. I will be talking to you today about the CO2 and carbon balance of an intensively grazed temperate pasture. And we'll look at the response to cultivation, but also drought. And before I start off, I'd like to acknowledge the input of my co-authors who have listed there. So we're going to move to the southern hemisphere for my presentation, uh, New Zealand. New Zealand is located uh, to the southeast of Australia, and it's as far south of the equator as Northern, um, Northern California is north of the equator. So we have a warm and temperate climate. Our predominant land use is uh, pasture agriculture, so grazed lands, with the majority of those lands um, grazed quite extensively by sheep or uh, beef cattle. About 15% of it, though, is used for dairy farming. And this is quite an intensive practice with year-round outdoor rotational grazing. So we don't uh, house our animals inside over winter. Over the last 20 years or so ago, this land use has intensified with increased uh, nutrient inputs, so fertilization, um, increased stocking rates, and use of supplemental feed. Up until 20 years or so ago, it was assumed that the amount of carbon stored in the soils used for grazing wouldn't change over time because the land use didn't change. However, uh, an ongoing and recent um, resampling study has shown that soils under dairying have lost, on average, 
uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, about 100 grams of carbon per square meter per year. This loss was not found on the under soils, um, in soils that were under less extensive uh, grazing. Uh, sorry, more extensive, less intensive. Um, this is of concern, obviously, because of the importance of soil organic matter for um, soil quality and production, and also because it's such an important store of global carbon and may impact the climate in this way if we lose too much. We don't know uh, what caused the losses, and we also don't know whether they're still ongoing. However, it may mean that the soils under dairying are below their capacity to store carbon, and we may be able, with the right um, management practices, to get that carbon content up again. So this has provided us focus for our current work, and the goal of our work is to determine the effect of climate variability and management practices on the CO2 and carbon balances of dairy pastures with a specific aim to increase soil carbon gains or to decrease losses. And this work is funded through the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre. The scope of my presentation today, then, is that I'll present you with four years' worth of CO2 and uh, carbon balance data from a dairy pasture, and we'll look at the effect of interannual variation, including the effect of a drought, and the effect of occasional cultivation of the permanent pasture. Uh, pastures are cultivated in New Zealand, um, mostly because of... Um, it's a part of pasture renewal, so when the, when the farmer sees the, the production of a, a sward decline, he wants to put in a new sward, and then he first cultivates and then sows the new sward. So it does happen about every five to ten years. The method that we use then, instead of resampling the soil over time, which requires you to wait a long time between measurements and also requires a lot of replication, we use the net ecosystem carbon balance method. And this means that we measure all the flows of carbon in and out of the ecosystem, thereby deducing what must have happened um, in, with the change in soil carbon store. So this put, means putting numbers on the, all the arrows in the, the diagram. The largest two flows of carbon are photosynthesis and respiration, and for that we use eddy covariance. The, the third largest arrow here is carbon imports and exports. Imports could be the supplemental feed that I mentioned earlier, but also uh, effluent or manure in inputs. Main export, obviously, on the dairy farm is milk. And to get those numbers, we rely on farm records. Then there's three uh, fluxes of carbon that are remaining. They're generally smaller. Methane and leaching numbers um, we estimate using literature values. And erosion we tend to ignore at our sites because they are flat. Measurements were made on the North Island of New Zealand at Scott Farm, which is um, a research farm managed by Dairy NZ. Dairy NZ is a um, dairy industry funded organization which does research which aims to increase the profitability of the industry, the dairy industry, but also uh, reduce their environmental impact. So the researchers from Dairy NZ were managing our site, but they kindly allowed us to make our measurements there as well. We started our measurements in December 2007, and we stopped them earlier this year. Okay, on to some results then. So I will be showing you four years' worth of data, but I'll pop them up one year at a time so that we can talk through and see what happened. So on the x-axis here we have time, and on the y-axis we have gray bars, which represent a monthly CO2 exchange, so 12 bars per year. The same data is shown in the black line, uh, but cumulatively per year. Upwards, a uh, trending line of positive bars are losses, and the opposite is gains. So downwards, trending or negative bars is gains. So we see then in 2008, a region was hit by a, quite a severe drought, a one in a hundred year drought. Now we normally do experience some dry conditions over summer, but not as severe as this one, um, this time. And we lost about 100 grams of carbon in the first four months, per square meter, sorry, uh, in the first four months of the year. So quite severe losses there. However, this dry period was followed by quite a mild winter. It was about a degree warmer than, um, than it normally is. And uh, it was quite a productive winter. And the spring is always um, productive. So I should have said that, obviously, be, being in the Southern Hemisphere, everything is uh, the other way around from um, Northern Hemisphere. So at the end of the bar, there is the, um, our spring period. Quite good uptake. And by the end of the year, the site was definitely a sink for CO2 despite um, the losses over the first part of the year because of the drought. In 2009, then, was a, that was a much more normal year, so it wasn't nearly as dry as in 2008. And we see a little bit of a loss there, 60 grams of uh, carbon per square meter, which may be caused by the drought in combination with a silage cut that was made around the tower. 
However, this was followed by quite a cold winter, and for quite a couple of months there, the growing conditions were pretty poor, and not much happened. Um, so not a lot of carbon was, mixed, was fixed in that period, and then afterwards the spring came and was quite a good period again. So both of these years the site was a sink um, for CO2. If we then complete the budget, um, with adding in all the numbers for the other arrows and other flows of carbon in and out. And I don't want you to focus too much in great detail on it. I just want to focus on the bottom number there, which is the net ecosystem carbon balance. We see that in 2008, despite the drought, the site was a sink for CO2, 85 grams per square meter uh, per year. And in 2009, um, the amount of carbon fixed was very close to, you know, to the uncertainty. So we'd have to say that the site was neutral. So we find it's a, maybe a small um, sink, maybe neutral. Definitely not uh, matches, sorry, it definitely doesn't match the um, losses that were found by the resampling study that I mentioned earlier. Now this could obviously easily be explained by the fact that we only have one site and we don't know whether the losses that were measured by the resampling study were actually ongoing. Another explanation could be that Scott Farm being a research farm uh, may experience more frequent cultivations because the um, researchers from Darien said they try more different swords uh, than a farmer would. So our, the cultivation frequency at Scott Farm is probably every five years, whereas maybe at a, at, a, at a normal farm it would be every five to ten years, so a bit um, less frequent. So I'm sure you're all aware of the effect of cultivation, but I'll just quickly step us through this. Um, what happens to the soil carbon store when cultivation happens. Obviously, in New Zealand, we spray the pasture first, and then it gets cultivated and turned over. So obviously, the inputs um, of carbon through photosynthesis stop at that time, uh, which could cause a loss of soil organic carbon. Uh, but more importantly, probably, is that the microbial respiration increases. And this is because you've just, with the turning over of the soil, you've increased aeration, you've broken up aggregates, and now the organic matter is exposed to microbial decomposition. So it's quite common to see a large flush of CO2 coming off a system like that. So those would both uh, lead to a decrease in uh, soil organic matter in the soil. There's two other processes going on, though, which may offset that a little bit. Um, we have incorporated by turning the soil over with part of the old swords still in there. Um, so we have incorporated some dead organic matter, and part of that may actually get stabilized. So that may be a small input. Also, we're counting on more vigorous growth after pasture renewal. That's the first reason we wanted to do the, uh, the renewal in the first place. So this may also uh, increase the inputs into the system a bit. So it's an interplay between definitely more outputs, but maybe also a little bit more inputs. So let us look then at um, 2010, what happened at our site when the majority of the footprint was cultivated, and very clearly we see here large losses of CO2. And if I just add up those three bars, it would have, um, the estimate is uh, 210 grams of per square meter lost over three months of cultivation. The sward that was put in was uh, quite high in diversity, more than normal for us. Um, in addition to ryegrass and clover, they also put in prairie grass, uh, lucerne, plantain, and chicory. So it was quite a mix that was put in. And in the second, year of the, uh, second half of the year, you see that uh, pasture really establishing and a lot of carbon taken up. So much so that um, by the end of the year, the site was actually a sink for CO2 again, despite the losses uh, caused by the cultivation. 2011 then was the first year of the high diversity sward and what draws our attention is that the losses during the dry period and it was about equally dry as it was in 2009 seem to be smaller under this sward. So maybe this sward with its more and deeper roots um, is a little bit less susceptible to drought. And the second half of the year was uh, really quite productive as well. So good carbon fixing in that last year. If we then uh, complete the carbon budget and I put in all the other numbers of the diagram and we take off from 2010 because that's where we left off, we see that definitely 2010 was neutral, definitely not, not a sink there, but obviously this was caused by the cultivation. It wasn't a, a, a source though. And 2011 was very similar to 2009 in that um, the amount of carbon fix was about the same as our uncertainty, so we'd have to say that it was uh, neutral. And I'd have to say that these budgets are preliminary as well because they need recalculating. But I'm pretty sure they're pretty close. Now, we did two more experiments into the effect of cultivation. And they were smaller scale studies and at different times of the year. Uh, we used chambers to quantify the losses of carbon caused by these cultivation events. Uh, one was done in the, in the drought I mentioned in 2008. 
And the other one, experiment two, was done six months later in spring when moisture, lim moisture was not limited at all. Actually, growing conditions are generally really good at that time of year. And we compared two different soils. Now, to quantify the effect of cultivation, I um, here have the, looked at the difference between the cultivated paddock and control paddocks, so undisturbed uh, pasture. And for the control, I used uh, eddy covariance numbers because it wasn't cultivated at the same time as uh, the cultivations during with that we measured using the chamber. So then in uh, autumn 2008, during the drought, we lost about 80 grams of um, carbon per square meter. So quite limited losses, and this was both caused by inhibited respiration, because it was so dry, but also because the control site wasn't very positive, uh, wasn't very productive at all. It actually was losing carbon at the same time. It's just that we lost a little bit more because we cultivated. In spring, uh, the story was very different because uh, respiration was not limiting. Also, the control site was very um, fixing a lot of carbon because it was good growing conditions, and losses were about three to 400 grams uh, per square meter over about 40 days. So very different story depending on what the moisture conditions are. Just for comparison, I, popped up, I will pop up the, um, edit the cultivation that we looked at earlier with eddy covariance. Obviously, I don't have a control for that study because it was actually the eddy covariance site that went, underwent the cultivation. So just very coarsely, I just compared it with the, um, any year of the same period um, of, the, of the year, but in 2009, because that seemed to be the most similar year. And then the losses come out of, at 150 grams of carbon per square meter over 40 days. So that sits right between the losses that we find during the really intense drought and the, and the moist conditions in spring, so that seems to fit quite well. To conclude and summarize then, over four years the site was carbon neutral, or maybe even a small sink, despite large disturbances of drought and cultivation. The severe drought caused a loss of about 100 grams per square meter, and the cultivation effect ranged between 80 and 400 grams per square meter. The effect of cultivation depended on the soil conditions because we saw the cultivation on the moist conditions led to far larger losses, which is exactly what you would expect. We also learned that the effect of disturbances was not necessarily additive. When we cultivated during the drought, we didn't lose twice as much carbon. If anything, we lost a little bit less. We have learned, though, in doing this that uh, modeling is required to get the full picture, especially to uh, disentangle the effect of weather and management, and we are working with modelers to get... Uh, to get more insight into that. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who helped me and the funding agencies and uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, you come, come Let's move on to okay. our next presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Alfredo Hood, who is also from the other side of the planet. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, my um, collaborators here, um, in particular um, Guillermo, who um, he, he uh, presented the, his first results of his dissertation on Monday at AGU, and these results had just been uh, accepted in Nature. And here we have uh, Yong Guang, who uh, it has a poster presentation in this session tomorrow. So um, luckily, we heard a little bit about this earlier with uh, Li Zhang's talk, that um, <clears throat> there's some pretty high-level, large-scale warm droughts that have occurred globally in various parts of the world, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. And these have greatly impacted on vegetation productivity with big impacts on food security and everything. Um, we kind of wanted to investigate the nature of water and productivity relationships during uh, droughts as well as during um, extreme wetting events. So that's sort of like um, what we're focusing on in this talk. And um, we're interested in studying these relationships cross biome. And I guess this is just one example of a, pres a paper published that deals with some of the uh, net primary production aspects of uh, drought. So this would be uh, 
more or less what's happened recently in Australia. Um, this is just an, indi an indicator here, the Palmer Drought Index, just to kind of show like in 2000 we had a fairly wet year, and following that we've entered into a prolonged drought through um, almost 2009, and then not shown here would be that in 2010 there was a sudden wet event, and 2000, for two years it became the two wettest years in um, Australia. So the objectives here are to investigate cross-biome productivity responses to wetting and dry cycles in Australia, um, investigate how these relate with rainfall, so rainfall use efficiencies, as well as water use efficiencies by investigating and e evapotranspiration. And also we're kind of curious about the um, extreme wet year in 2010 compared to the wet year in 2000, difference being that you had um, a good severe drought, decadal drought in between these two, and it, we're sort of like interested in exploring the resilience aspect here as to whether or not the biomes in 2010 could fully recover as they were in 2000 after going through that prolonged drought. So to do this, um, a lot of this work um, following methods that were presented by um, Guillermo. And basically we derived annual measures of ANPP using a MODIS satellite surrogate, in this case the uh, integrated EVI, um, this product here. Um, we also use TRIM for our rainfall measures and computed rain use efficiency um, using the uh, surrogate for ANPP by the annual rainfall. We computed water use efficiencies by using the same ANPP surrogate divided by ET using a ET model that was um, developed by Zhang et al. And we, in order to compute that ET model, we needed a tree cover fraction, which we used from an uh, Australian-based um, tree cover fraction product by Donahue. And then we looked at these um, relationships cross biome as well as within vegetation classes using a uh, vegetation classification within Australia. Um, this is just pr to present a, a sort of like the um, temporal frequency year to year that you can get from every pixel using MODIS data and how we integrated this function here to derive a surrogate for uh, EV uh, ANPP. And basically the difference in this model here is that um, since Australian tree cover fraction is more or less evergreen year round, uh, we didn't rely on uh, beginning and start of the growing season since basically um, there's some production going around going uh, year round. So we integrated across the entire year. Um, this is a um, proxy measure of ANPP from IEVI using this methodology that was developed using in-situ measurements of ANPP across a wide range of biomes in uh, North and South America. Um, this would be the vegetation class, and I just wanted to show that we, in addition to looking at this continental scale, we also looked at a uh, NAT transect, Northern Australia tropical transect, and Southeast. Southeast Australia being that had the most severe drought impact, and the uh, North the NAT transect being an area that didn't have such a severe drought. Um, this is just an example of some of the outputs we have. So for 2010, this would be the trim uh, rainfall data showing the uh, large um, wetting cycle here. Um, this would be the equivalent uh, integrated EVI for that 2010 period. And this is just as an example showing you a dry year um, what the, um, in 2002 where there was mostly drought. Um, if we just, from a concept point of view, um, if we just start off with the uh, NAT transect here, which goes from a wet tropical savanna to open woodland into our Molga semi-arid savanna system here. We can, it's an ecological um, rainfall gradient, and we can kind of see here the trim, the um, loss in uh, rainfall as you proceed southward from north to south and the corresponding uh, integrated EVI values that fall along this transect. Um, if we look at this particular diagram here and look at the in 
the uh, surrogate for ANPP versus rainfall, you see that you get separate relationships year to year. Um, in general, you expect the positive relationship between the two. Um, notice that in the wet years, you get a slightly curved linear relationship as you proceed to uh, a lot of rainfall, you start seeing that water is no longer a limiting factor and nutrients and energy or light become more limiting and you don't get any extra productivity. In drier years, you see the shift to the left and the slopes become steeper, indicating a steeper or a higher rain use efficiency. And it's hard to see this, but the regression lines become more linear and very uh, more tight, indicating that water is explaining uh, more of the um, variation in productivity. Now, if we go to any particular site along this transect here, we can see that within biome or within um, savanna class, you, you see something that's totally unrelated to this positive linear relationship down here, that basically from a within class point of view, you can get relationships that go horizontal, inverse, um, positive, all directions. And to us, this is an indication that um, each, each vegetation class has its own mechanisms for reacting to uh, dry and wet rainfall periods. And they're not just going to go dropping down in a single relationship like this. They actually have their own separate behavior. So this only applies to cross biome. Within biome can totally go different ways. And if we take all of these years, and per pixel then select the driest year. So it's irrespective of what year it occurred. You see, we can get, even get a uh, steeper or higher water rainfall use efficiency. And of course, then the question begs, you know, at to what point can you get uh, a mechanism where instead of decreasing an ANPP, a plant might actually increase its water use efficiency to sustain the same level of productivity despite the lower rainfall. Um, an example of this dilemma with the different years would be this is 2004 for continental all vegetation classes. Um, we have a nice steep relationship because it was a relatively dry year. But if we go to 2005, it's, you see this bilinear relationship here. So the problem here is that the spatial heterogeneity of droughts. So this section of Australia spatially was in drought. But this section of Australia, spatially, was normal. So this presents a problem, and it's mostly why we decided to go to this dry year versus wet year on a per pixel basis, because any year in particular may have droughts, all kinds of conditions going on for that same year. Um, so this is just showing you representations of uh, selecting which year of those 12 years had the least rainfall and which year had the greatest rainfall. Of course, this pink area is the 2010 wet period that happened recently. So if we do that and now calculate the uh, integrated EVI or our surrogate of ANPP, we can get a value for mean year, dry, driest pixel year, wettest pixel year. And from that, we can start looking at these uh, relationships across Australia per biome across biome and so on for these different uh, wetting and drying cycle conditions. So this is kind of what we expect with our rainfall use efficiency. That's the driest per pixel year, the mean regression line through that, the mean and the wet showing that for all of these uh, vegetation classes, it's got independent and unique functions as a function of rainfall for these separate periods, drought and wet areas. If we take the mean of each vegetation class in here and plot those, we can kind of see the same uh, relationship, very tight relationships with high R squares from wet periods to average periods to the dry periods, showing that uh, vegetation is compensating for some of the uh, shortage of rainfall by increasing its rain use efficiency. Now, if we do this with evapotranspiration by using the Zhang model, ET model, um, we can see that the lines have become steeper and tighter, and you still see an increase in the uh, slope or water use efficiency here after removing such 
non-biological factors as uh, storage and runoff. So there's still a mechanism with the vegetation where it's able to increase its water use efficiency per measured by ET in periods of drought and still sustain higher levels of productivity than would be expected otherwise. Um, if we go to Southeast Australia that had the big drought impact, uh, we can see the same behavior. That's rain use efficiency, here's water use efficiency, and if we take the mean of all of these vegetation classes, uh, we see uh, slight increases in the slopes and very tight regression lines. Um, so then these would be uh, depictions of the same um, water use efficiency in the uh, average condition, the wet condition, and dry condition. Um, this being done computed per pixel by using the ratio, which is different from doing it um, cross biome and where you're actually using slopes. So we find the expected relationship where uh, water use efficiency actually does increase as you go from a wet cycle to a average and a dry cycle. What was unexpected, of course, is that we were expecting to see a convergence toward uh, very high water use efficiencies that would be similar across biome types. And the problem, the reason we had that particular problem is because doing this per pixel means you're doing it on a site level basis and we're mixing within class variations with cross site and cross biome variations. So that's something we're going to still be working on. Um, and I guess I'm going to finish up here. This is just a final uh, message here that we then did some ratioing and comparison directly of 2010 with 2000, the two wet peaks in here to try to see if there was any loss in resilience. And to the contrary, we see that we actually were, um, came back pretty strongly. There was no loss at all. 2010 had uh, better productivity than 2000, even compensating for the rainfall and ET. Okay, so I think my conclusions. So these biomes are pretty resilient, we think, based on just the measures we, that we did right now. And we think that biomes are capable of tolerating droughts through different mechanisms, some of them which may include increasing water use efficiencies. And basically, um, I think I'll end it with that. They do support the results that Guillermo presented on Monday as well. Thanks. No, basically we, we have a surrogate, an empirical measure, where we just took for a variety of land cover types and actual in-situ measurements of ANPP and directly regressed it with the satellite product and used that as our surrogate of measure. You can also do a surrogate using GPP, and basically the point is necessarily not having an accurate measure of ANPP as much as having a relative measure of productivity that then you can compare cross site, cross years, and so on. Yes, and supposedly those factors would be part of that initial where we actually matched the MODIS satellite with the actual in situ conditions at the time that people measured ANPP. We discuss. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to our last talk from our first session today. And uh, the speaker, I think, is uh, James Fox.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, I'm James Fox, and I'm presenting here on behalf of our group, uh, including uh, Elliot Campbell at University of California, uh, Merced, and, and Peter Acton, a uh, graduate, st graduate student with me at the University of Kentucky. And uh, <clears throat> we were looking at how uh, terrestrial carbon losses from mountaintop coal mining offsets uh, regional forest carbon sequestration uh, into the 21st century. And basically, uh, we realize here that carbon ass assessments for North America uh, find particularly large sinks in the southeastern United States forest. Uh, however, uh, this forest region, the sink in this forest region may be Im impacted by extreme uh, land use disturbance events due to mountaintop coal mining. And so uh, here looking at our, 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 our domain, basically uh, about 5 million hectares in the uh, southern Appalachian forest region. This is located in uh, eastern Kentucky, uh, southwestern West Virginia, and uh, western Virginia, eastern Tennessee, uh, United States. And this is a region that has uh, biodiverse mixed mesophytic forests with uh, dense forest cover and high terrestrial carbon storage in the, in the above ground biomass in the soils. And uh, just, just a photo to get a sense of the dense deciduous forests of this region. And uh, here these forest ecosystems such as the Southern Appalachian Forest region represent an important sink for anthropogenic emissions of CO2 to the Earth's atmosphere. We know that. We know that. And, and this uh, region in North America, secondary forest regrowth is, is expected to be a dominant driver of this uh, forest carbon sink. And so uh, then also what we have going on in this region is, is really intense uh, energy production. So uh, th this region accounts for nearly a, nearly a quarter of all the coal produced in the United States. And uh, we have uh, really extensive reserves, 24 billion metric tons remain, remaining, allowing for continued mining throughout the, the 21st century. And, and here, uh, uh, mountaintop coal mining practices account for about half of the mining in this region. Here we show a, a, a photo, uh, uh, an aerial view of, of some mountaintop coal mining in this, in this region. And, and basically, we, we see here a large coal truck to get a sense of of, of the scale here, but uh, basically what's done is the uh, harvestable timber is, is uh, first removed and clear cut from the land and then uh, the remaining above ground uh, uh, plant associated carbon and the soil carbon is scraped using uh, scrapers and, and stock piled and burned and then, and then uh, basically the overburden is removed uh, as much as 100 meters overburden is removed and stock piled. The coal is harvested and then uh, thereafter, the land is reclaimed uh, on that spoil. And so uh, obviously the, the carbon, the terrestrial carbon impact for this, uh, for this energy resource is, is going to be removing the above ground vegetation and then removing the soil carbon. And, uh, and then after mining, we do, uh, the land is reclaimed uh, with the spoil that is placed back on the land. Here we see, uh, for example, uh, in the foreground, a a mountaintop site uh, with a valley fill in the background where we've, uh, where the, the soil has been, the spoil has been compacted and then grasslands have been planted, which is, is typically, typically done here. And we were also con concerned with modeling, uh, modeling the carbon uptake on these reclaimed grasslands. And so our objective was, was really to apply ecosystem modeling and field data to estimate the potential impact of this future coal mining on the, on the carbon budget of this forest region. And then uh, uh, we really wanted to compare that to the uh, uh, projected carbon sinks from the secondary forest regrowth. And specifically, we're going to look at projections where we vary future mining rates uh, as well as uh, reclamation type, which I'll talk about here in, in a moment. So in order to uh, get an estimate for the, the forest carbon in the region, we use the uh, USDA Forest Service Carbon Online Estimator, or COAL, and that, that allowed us to estimate the uh, the non-soil or the uh, live tree, dead tree, understory, uh, lither, and the down woody debris. And then we, uh, we performed some sampling of uh, extensive sampling of these grassland sites, uh, which we published uh, those SSC results in 
uh, Acton et al. 2011 Environmental Science and Technology. And, and then in order to look at the, the future sequestration associated with secondary forest regrowth, we use the, the coal estimator and basically uh, considered the carbon stocks for the region by age class and used a, a mean age, uh, a mean current age class of 50 years. And so here uh, we essentially show a 100 year period uh, with the uh, non soil component on the y axis and different uh, forest covers and the, the sequestration due to the secondary forest regrowth. <clears throat> as far as the historic and future mining rates that we projected, the, the historic mining rates. Uh, here we used uh, Department of Energy data, uh, federal data, as well as state level data. And uh, here we show uh, uh, a timeline from 1960 to 2010. And uh, basically, we look at a uh, mountaintop coal mining uh, rate on the y axis. And, and here we're looking at surface area uh, disturbed per year. We know that that uh, mining started off in the, in the 60s, and we see it uh, leveling out in the, in the mid 80s. And, and uh, so that was really our historic rates to work with. And then uh, uh, obviously there's uncertainty in the future rates for this century. Uh, we looked at a 50% increase in mining uh, for the region based on energy security needs and uh, incre the increased amount of coal that would be needed uh, if we were to implement CO2 capture and se sequestration technologies at the power plants. And then we also looked at 50% uh, reduction and 100% reduction to 2100 uh, based on uh, reliance on energy, other energy sources. So 100% reduction would be a, a full phase out by 2100. Uh, we also considered during harvesting that uh, obviously some of, some of, during the clear cutting, some of that timber is, is taken into uh, 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 longer lived pools and landfills and wood products. And so that accounted for about about 10% of the harvestable non-plant carbon after, after 40 years. And then we also considered uh, using energy capture methods uh, to better sequester, remove carbon from the sites. That would, that would bring that number up to about 30% uh, of the sequester, 30% uh, sequestration from the non-plant carbon. As far as the, uh, the uptake in the uh, different, uh, uh, the uptake on the different reclaimed sites, we, we first looked at current practices which has favored this grassland reclamation method for this region. Uh, and then uh, there's been some experimental work that it is starting to promote reforestation for this region using uh, the approach uh, promoted by the Appalachian Re Regional Reforestation Initiative, or ARI. So we also considered that as an alternative to uh, reclamation. And so uh, currently these lands are grassland, these, these uh, uh, mine lands are grassland reclaimed. Uh, they're, they're heavily compacted uh, to reduce erosion and landslides uh, after the spoil has been replaced to the surface and then a mixture of grass seed and legumes is, is planted. And uh, that was a mountaintop site previously. Here's a valley fill site uh, where they've essentially planted the grasslands. And, uh, but now this, this airy reclamation or this reforestation is, has recently been promoted as a potential uh, method to use. And we, we have uh, quite a few experimental airy sites. We also have a 15-year uh, airy site with uh, seven or eight different, uh, uh, eight, eight, eight different uh, uh, tree covers, uh, plots. And there we were able to, to sample those sites and take uh, soil carbon data, which was, which was nice. And uh, so we used soil sampling and analysis to produce soil chrono SOC uh, sequestration estimates using chrono sequences. Uh, we projected the data forward using the method in Acton et al. As far as the grassland biomass carbon, we use the century model. And uh, for the, the non-soil carbon on the forest reclaimed sites, we use data from Amachev et al. 2007. So here we see a chrono sequence over about 15 years on uh, grassland reclaimed and reforested sites. And, and one finding that was, was kind of surprising to us is, is we really did not see a, a big difference in the, uh, in, the, in the carbon stocks on the reforested and uh, grassland sites. So that's one area that, that could really use improvement as far as its uh, sequestration methods in order to meet the sequestration potential. But when we, when we look at the cumulative soil carbon and, and non-soil carbon together, here we see 
uh, essentially the, the grassland uh, reclamation, uh, carbon stocks projected over a 125 year period, and then we see the reforested sites uh, projected over a 100, 125 year period. And uh, obviously there's not big difference in the, in the two soil components, but the, the, the discrepancy is, is due to the, the, uh, the non-soil non carbon. And so we see that the reforestation may sequester about over two times that of the grassland uh, projected ba grassland technique based on, our, based on our methods and projections. And so now if we put all these pieces together and, and really look at the, the results of the uh, uh, terrestrial carbon budget for this, this region, uh, we'll look at a series of slides here. First, here we have uh, really the, the historic and current conditions. And so we have a timeline from, from 1960 uh, to present on the x-axis. And then we have the terrestrial carbon and petagrams of uh, CO2 on the, the y-axis. And this terrestrial carbon is going to include both the soil carbon and the, and the non-soil component together, so the cumulative impact. And, and this is for the whole region, which is about 5 million hectares. And so the top line is a hypothetical line. That, that top line is representing if there was no mining uh, done at all. And so if there was no mining done since 1960, this top line would just represent secondary forest regrowth. And then this bottom line is, is when we subtract the terrestrial carbon due to the clear cutting and the mining operations, the clear cutting, stockpiling, and mining operations. And then this line in the middle is, is, is uh, really the, our line of concern. This is, this is when we include also the regrowth and the uptake, carbon uptake on the reclaimed land. So we see that about 0.4 petagram CO2 has been emitted in the region as the result of mountaintop coal mining impact on the above ground carbon and the soil carbon. And then about 14% of that has been returned uh, via reclamation. And uh, we have a, a current 3.2 petagram CO2 stored uh, in the above ground and soil uh, for the region. Now, it, now we are going to project forward. And, uh, and so here we go. We have a timeline from 2000 to 2010. And again, the terrestrial carbon on the y-axis. And, and uh, here we're considering a future carbon budget under the current mining rate. So we're going to project forward the current mountaintop coal mining rates uh, and using that grassland uh, reclamation that's been uh, the reclamation of choice. And so we see here three lines, and, and we include here uh, a, a top line, a hypothetical line, if we were to stop, uh, uh, if we were to stop uh, uh, using this mining practice today, essentially. And uh, basically, we see the, the uptake or the carbon sink due to the secondary forest regrowth. And then we see uh, two lines which represent mining at the uh, current rates. Uh, the first line, the lower line, is, is if we have that 10% sequestered carbon uh, due to timber and landfills that's, that, that goes to landfills uh, or in wood products. And then the middle line is when we increase that to a 30% sequestration when we, we use our energy capture techniques. And now we look at the scenario uh, where we essentially have varied mining rates and then we keep this grassland uh, reclamation technique. So now we, we're going, we, we show all the way back to 1960 up to 2100 uh, here. And what we're showing is, is again, that no mining after 2100 that I mentioned, the hypothetical unmined condition. But then we have essentially a 100% reduction in mining, so a complete phase out in mining by 2100 uh, for the region. We see that we uh, are almost carbon neutral for the 21st century. We see a 50% reduction, and then we see a 50% increase uh, in mining. And so we see that full phase out of uh, MCM practices would result in the SFR as a terrestrial neutral by 2100, uh, a 50% increase would result in, a, in an additional uh, sink for, for the region. And then we look at this idea of, of converting to a reforestation. And so uh, we, we consider 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100% reforestation. And we see that in the reforestation, uh, the region can start to become a, a carbon sink if we did start immediately with this 100% reforestation. And, and, and so basically this would result in a uh, carbon sink or neutral conditions for the region under reduced or current rates. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to keep moving here uh, due to uh, time, but uh, uh, basically the, the uncertainties within our estimates 
uh, some things that, that uh, provide uncertainties that underestimate our actual losses would be CO2 fertilization enhancement, so we've considered this and are working on that. Mineralization of ge geogenic organic carbon, uh, decreased coal extracted per hectare, and uh, a smaller fraction of carbon to be sequestered into wood products. And then we've also thought about methane emissions. And then overestimates might be from if we went back and re reclaimed those grasslands, and uh, basically if we uh, also were doing intensive, ex extensive uh, uh, harvesting in the non mine conditions. And so uh, we feel that this results are particularly useful for regional life cycle assessments uh, for this, this issue. And I'd, with that, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, uh, leave up here my acknowledgments and our funding for the project. <clears throat> so with that, any questions? Thank you, James. And uh, if you have any questions, please approach James afterwards. Okay. And uh, this ends our first session. And uh, our second session will start at 4 o'clock.